dissector and uh, sitting in for Mark Crispin Miller, the NYU professor who runs these first Tuesday political events here at this bookstore. And Mark couldn't make it tonight and asked me to sub in, maybe because he knew I have an affinity for the subject, having been a shop steward for the UE and also a uh, graduate of the Cornell University School of Labor Relations, London School of Economics, College of Hard Knocks, etc. So I've had some experience as an organizer and as an analyst of economic affairs, just so you know a little bit about me, I have a new film. I'm a filmmaker as well as a troublemaker, and my new film is called Plunder, The Crime of Our Time. And it looks at the financial crisis as a crime story, not as a business problem. And it also has a companion book, The Crime of Our Time. Anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here because the topic that Joe is talking about tonight, and I'll introduce Joe in a second, is also very close to me because I led a strike in Boston at a radio station, which, result, which went on for three weeks and which resulted in a complete victory for all of the employees. So I'm um, somebody who's had experiences with strikes. My, my father, who was in the Garment Workers Union, was also involved in strikes, as was his father. But <coughs> they didn't always have the, the same kind of outcome that the one I was involved in was. But at any rate, Joe comes to us today, basically, as, as somebody who has a point of view about how to revitalize the labor movement and how the labor movement and working people have to begin embracing the strike uh, as in, in a more aggressive way than has happened over the last you know, decades or so where we've gone from hundreds of strikes involving hundreds of thousands of workers to a handful of strikes. Joe is um, a veteran union negotiator. He's a labor lawyer. He's a former local union president. For the past decade, he's negotiated labor contracts in the airline and healthcare industries. He has a law degree from the New York University, uh, New York University Law School, is that right? That's right. And uh, so he's very well credentialed, he's very well experienced, and he's very angry about what's going on. He also, as you read his book, Reviving the Strike, which I did before this talk tonight, I found that one of the lessons, and, and at least one filmmaker in the audience will be interested in this, that he, as a college student in the mid-80s, traveled to Austin, Minnesota to join a picket line uh, of striking meat packers at Hormel and was part of that struggle which really energized a lot of people in the Midwest and a lot of Americans learned about it through the film American Dream and the issues that it raised are still with us today. Not just the, the activities of the unions but also of veteran organizers like Ray Rogers who was attempting to create corporate campaigns to support the labor campaigns. So Joe Burns, welcome to this wonderful bookstore. Thank you so much for having us here. And, and uh, why don't you give us a little kind of summary of your perspective, and then I'll have some questions. We're supposed to have a conversation, but I can recede as you uh, step forward with your point of view. Okay, uh, let me just uh, give you a little overview of the book and uh, how I came to write it. Uh, Basically, when I started out, I didn't really uh, intend to write a book about the strike or uh, one entitled or one titled uh, "Reviving the Strike." I was originally uh, a lot more interested in labor law and how it operated as a system of labor control. But as I continued uh, in my research for the book, I became more and more interested in labor history and labor economics. And a lot of what I could tell for the problems of the labor movement uh, seemed to be that we had abandoned some fundamental principles of traditional labor economics and theory. And when you look at it, for the first 150 years of trade unionism here in the United States, the strike was the centerpiece of trade union strategy. 
Uh, in fact, if you uh, went back and told people that you were going to have a labor movement not based on a strike, even conservative trade unionists would look at you as uh, being odd. The strike was, as uh, economist Albert Reese declared in 1962, by far the most important source of union power. And in fact, when you look from the, the period of the greatest union strength in this country, from the 1930s well into the 1970s, what you see is that the trade unionists, uh, through collective bargaining backed by a powerful strike, were able to construct a powerful labor movement which was capable of transforming the lives of an entire generation of working people, both union and non-union. The unions through strikes were able to transform the wage structures in entire industries. So you take an industry at like meat packing or trucking and what you see is thousands of workers striking at once, not like the isolated strikes of today, and in doing so, uh, able to forge a powerful labor movement. So one of the things I looked at was, why is it that the strike was so powerful back then? And today, obviously, the strike is not something feared by employers. It's something often feared by workers. And the reason is the strike today differs fundamentally from the traditional strike of the labor movement. The traditional strike of the labor movement had two key features to it uh, in order to be successful. And you can tell this by, you know, not only studying labor history, but also looking at economics textbooks from the 1950s through the 1980s. And what you'll find is that there's two key features, as I said, to the strike. Uh, the first is workplace-based solidarity, uh, meaning workers acted together across workplaces and industries. And the second was that a strike was capable of stopping production. So let's just take a couple seconds and look at these uh, key factors here. Solidarity is the heart and soul of trade unionism. Yet today, the solidarity that we're able to <laughs> legally employ is a pale imitation of the solidarity employed by trade unionists. That's because today's solidarity is you, you do fundraisers, and a lot of the trade unionists here have probably participated where you do fundraisers for workers who are on strikes, or maybe you join their picket lines. But in the past, workers were able to, to band together as workers in their workplaces and exercise a deep and powerful form of solidarity. And there are really three elements to that solidarity. The first is industry-wide strikes. When you think of the great strikes of trade union history, the bread and roses strike of the, of the textile workers in uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts in the 1910s, or you look at the strike wave of 1946 where hundreds of thousands of mine workers joined hundreds of thousands of steel workers and hundreds of thousands of auto workers all striking at the same time and winning the same 18 and a half cent wage increase. What you find is they didn't strike one workplace at a time, they struck entire industries at once. The second point with workplace-based solidarity that workers were able to use is they had what's now called by the law secondary strikes and secondary boycotts. And uh, an example of a secondary strike would be, let's say I strike uh, brewery workers, we go on strike and we're striking a beer. Uh, what we would do in the old days is we would go set up a picket line at the local bar and we would ask the bartenders union to go out on strike, not in support of their own demands, but in support of us as fellow workers. And you saw that form of solidarity be so effective that it allowed a highly fragmented industry such as trucking in the 1930s with thousands and thousands of independent contractors. It allowed the Teamsters Union to build a powerful contract that, benerated, that benefited generations of working class Americans. And they were able to do that through secondary activity. But then what you find is that employers understood this, and I think they've always understood something far better than trade unionists. What they understood was that if they win one strike, 
they've only they've only defeated that union in that particular battle but what they determined was if they could change the rules of the game they could win strike after strike after strike and what we're seeing them doing we're seeing that phenomenon play out again in the public sector today where they're going after the laws uh, governing collective bargaining in state after state. So can I, can I yeah. throw in a question here? Sure. Uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, at some point along the way, uh, not only did the employers uh, become more sophisticated in their tactics and the use of uh, their propaganda outfits and the use of the media, but it seems like the unions themselves began to change their outlook. They wanted to be accepted. They wanted to find base, a base of cooperation uh, with management. They wanted to, uh, f you know, find a way to, to, to limit conflict rather than, or manage conflict rather than exacerbate conflict. What, how did that happen and, 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 and how do you account for it? Well, I think what you saw is that the, the period after the tumultuous 1930s, you saw trade unionism become institutionalized for a number of decades. And you saw after the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, you saw the Cold War and the driving out of the left wing of the labor movement. And in doing so, many of the ideas that are necessary for successful trade unionism were eliminated and many unions became conservative and complacent. So when you jump forward and although you still had a fair degree of, of uh, strike activity during this period, but a lot of it was fairly routine. When you came to the employer offensive of the 1980s, what you found were unions who were completely incapable of dealing with the employer offensive. There was also a way in which, you know, certain pattern bargaining started or, or you know, in, in, in auto, one, one company would be singled out as opposed to a strike against the whole industry to try to set the standard. And that sort of inevitably divides workers also because uh, you know some people are working some people aren't working what was the kind of strategic or ideological reasons for this uh, you saw a different a, a different vehicles in different industries but basically the general idea during this period of the 1930s through the 70s and even before the 1910s the, the general idea was to standardize wages in, in the industry. And what trade unionists understood was that you could not have stable trade unionism unless you were able to, through a number of vehicles, uh, standardize wages. Because otherwise you get what happens today, such as in the airline industry, even though you've got extremely high levels of unionization, some unions have better contracts than the others and basically undercut the if a union is successful in winning pensions and benefits and so forth, then they're undercut by their lower wage um, competitors. So I think that's what you saw uh, in the in the auto industry. They use pattern bargaining, but in the in trucking and steel, they they form these multi-employer agreements. What you saw during the 1980s was a complete destruction of the patterns. And I think Kim Moody from Labor Notes has written a, a fair degree on this about how the what what happened became a race to the bottom where unions undercut union locals undercut locals even in their in their own union and industry what about what about the role of sort of how you put it like consumption the way you know uh, working people who had regarded themselves maybe as workers now were also defined as consumers and you know we're, we're going into debt to buy to join the middle class, to be part of the middle class. And part of that seems to have led to a, a loss of militancy or a loss of ideology in labor. In other words, there was everybody who was out for themselves more than working together towards a common goal. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at it, uh, and, and at least in my own experience, uh, the, there is a latent militancy out there among the working class and I think you saw that tapped to, into in Madison where you had tens of thousands of people once they thought that there was a vehicle to fight back uh, stood up and fight back. I think what you saw during the 1980s 
was it, it wasn't a problem that the union members weren't willing to fight back and take a stand. And you saw that in industry after industry, whether it was Greyhound, whether it was uh, Hormel, which you mentioned in meatpacking, whether it was Feltz Dodge and mining. Uh, the problem is when workers did fight back, one, they weren't supported in all too many cases by their international unions, and two, they fought back utilizing the rules of a rig, a rig game. And they would basically just set up a picket line and watch the scabs uh, stream by and the products go out. And that sort of strike didn't work in the 1980s, and in fact, it never worked in trade union history. So, there, I mean, has Wisconsin led to some sort of reassessment, reappraisal? Is there a, uh, you know, are we just fighting to retain what we, we've, you know, always had, collective bargaining? Or, you know, or is labor becoming more uh, conscious in terms of needing to make deeper changes in our economy and our society? In other words, it seems to me that one of the problems with, with a strike is if you have just the sort of trade union consciousness, where workers want wages, they want better wages, they want working conditions, they want to protect their jobs, but they don't really have anything to say or interest in or knowledge of what's happening in the larger economy, uh, labor becomes less of an influential force and it ends up tailing after the Democratic Party. A lot of the money uh, from the AFL-CIO, et cetera, et cetera, goes into contributions to Democratic politicians who court them during elections and then reject them after elections. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for people who want to see a more independent trade union movement, uh, in order to have that, we have to have the revival of the strike. Because basically, trade unionism must be, be based on a foundation of support. And if we don't have direct economic uh, methods as workers to employ, then you're going to see what happens today, where basically trade unionists, trade unions are forced to rely on the power of the government in order to survive. So what you saw um, since the 1980s is you saw an inability of trade unions to organize in the private sector, and you saw a retreat into the public sector. So last year, for the first time, you see a majority of union members being in the public sector. And as a as a result of that, you're very vulnerable to attack because obviously if you're relying on politicians, what they give you, they can take away and that's what we're seeing nowadays. At, at the same time, there came a point, and I think you know, people were very heartened by this, you know, where uh, people who ordinarily had not uh, stood up together, some of whom may even have voted for Walker and for the Republicans in Wisconsin became, you know, a kind of a very volatile force for change and still seem to be, you know, and, you know, there was even international dimension to it. There were signs about it. fight, let's fight like an Egyptian, you know, a focus, uh, you know, inspiration from what happened in Egypt, which also started as a, not in Tahrir Square, but as a labor uh, strikes and, and battles in the unions in Egypt were really responsible for creating this mass movement. The question here is, how has labor responded to Wisconsin? Is there an effort being made to try to deepen uh, people's understanding and resolve? Yeah, I, I think I, uh, on, in really two different ways. Uh, on the one hand, I think the attacks that are coming from the right wing on trade unionism are prompting a lot of soul searching within the labor movement. And I think what we're hopefully going to see is even some of the more conservative elements within the trade union movement starting to uh, question some fundamentals. Um, because at this point, the very survival of the trade union movement is at stake. Uh, on the other hand, I think you also see that what happened in Wisconsin can really teach us a lot about the revival of the trade union movement. And I think it can teach us about the kind of trade union movement that's going to be capable of reviving the strike. Uh, because what you saw in Wisconsin was it was a mass upsurge of people. You would go, I drove over from 6 o'clock in the morning from the Twin Cities. I got there. The official rally was over. But 
workers kept on coming in tens and tens with the ones and twos with their homemade signs and there were tens of thousands of people and the official rally really didn't matter and that's the kind of upsurge which traditionally has fueled most of the growth in the labor movement so i think when we think of reviving the strike at least how i think of it it's not necessarily this uh, isolating conservative strike that we've seen in in recent decades it looks a lot more like perhaps the uh, 2006 immigrant workers strike which was the biggest strike of the last decade um, and which was not your traditional strike I mean I was in Los Angeles uh, for, for then and it was uh, it was unbelievably large and a, a very vibrant and very energetic and it seems like one of the things that we're seeing is a sort of come coming together in some respects of labor and a, a progressive or a self-defined progressive movement that wants to support uh, unions and maybe work together. They would talk of a general strike. I mean, all of that. How, how realistic is, is building those kinds of alliances? I, I think a lot of unions are focused on how, how to build alliances. And there, there's a real focus. and. Um, some folks are taking that to its extreme and basically uh, thinking that the trade union movement can abandon the workplace and no longer engage in collective bargaining. And what I argue in my book is th that's a mistake because I think if we really want a social unionism, it's a social unionism that's rooted in workers' power. And at the heart of that has always been the strike. And for anyone who's participated in a strike, um, it's, it's a transformative event and every strike that I've been part of or worked on, it's something that changes people's consciousness in the process of striking. So you go down to Austin, Minnesota, this conservative town in southern Minnesota in the mid-1980s and workers go on strike there and they decided to take a stand. And in taking a stand, they inspired the entire labor movement across the country. And they brought in thousands of trade unionists, but they also changed themselves. So on their union hall, they had a mural featuring um, Nelson Mandela. And it also had, if blood be the price of their cursed wealth, then good God, we have paid in full. Now, the rest of the story is when the international trustee them, they came in and uh, sandblasted that mural off the wall and they couldn't find a union outfit to do it, so they brought in a bunch of scabs to do it. So that's the other side of the, uh, of the problem we face in trade unionism. What about the situation today where we have so many people, so many young people who would be presumably the potential militants in a new generation, so many people of, of color, so many people from different communities who are involved in, in, in wage, working for wages, but also a large group of unemployed people who seem to be increasingly permanently unemployed. How do you organize a strike when people don't have jobs? Well, I mean, different groups of people will, uh, in different sectors of the working class will require uh, different forms of organization. So what you saw in the 1930s, uh, you know, prior to the mass upsurges, you saw unemployed councils formed and establishing the militancy. And when those workers became employed, uh, they played a key role both in uh, helping the strikes but also in supporting the strikes. So I, you know, I think the basic answer is, you know, trade unionism must be able to offer something for working people and it must be able to offer the hope of a better life. And concretely, there's one key tactic which has been able to do that, and that has been an effective strike. And as I said before, it's not a strike uh, that looks very much like the strike we're able to do today, because basically, effective strike tactics have been outlawed. Um, solidarity is outlawed, both through the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, but also through uh, decades of judicial decisions. The labor movement traditionally viewed courts as the enemy of trade unionism because they understood that judges make political decisions and when they make those political decisions, they're gonna make them in a manner that doesn't favor working people. So what you see is all of the essential elements, solidarity, stopping production, becoming uh, outlawed uh, by the courts over a period of 30, 40 years. But even worse, you see a trade union movement 
which starts to accept that as the new reality, to accept that as a, a logical form of trade unionism. So, and what you, what you have then is one of the most conservative trade unionism in trade union history. Even if you go back to Samuel Gompers and conservative trade unionists, he was the head of the AFL in the 1910s. What you find is, you know, statements from him saying, um, you know, judicial uh, injunctions should have no, I consider to have no effect. You see the IWW in their constitution saying um, all members should treat injunctions uh, with contempt. So, I mean, that's the type of labor movement and relationship to the law that you had. You had a labor movement who understood that the rules of the game were rigged and that in, or, that in order to win, trade unionists needed to break beyond that. And I guess what I'm suggesting today is that is the type of trade union movement that we need to build because the rules of the game are rigged. Just one more point for me and then we'll open it up. I mean, the IWW talked about workers of the world unite. We're now in a global economy. We're not just dealing with, you know, our communities, you know, the, the one factory in town that runs everything. You know, there are still some places like that. But, you know, production is, is, uh, is globalized, it's decentralized, it's jobs are outsourced, and all the rest of it. There are some people trying to operate globally. Ray Rogers, who is an organizer in, in Austin, Minnesota, has been working with Coca-Cola workers in Latin America, trying to help them uh, deal with the Coca-Cola company where there have been tremendous human rights abuses and the like. But it doesn't seem as if certainly the leadership of the AFL-CIO or international labor leaders or many even activists who, uh, in their discourse talk about this global dimension of labor and the challenge that we have to try to find ways to work across borders. Yeah, I mean, one of the <laughs> obvious problems facing trade unions is uh, operating within the global economy. And trade unionists have always had to deal with uh, shifting uh, labor and product markets. Um, what workers have to face today is they operate in a situation where we have global markets in both the products and labor, and that's going to require a fundamentally different uh, type of labor movement. Obviously, for far too many decades, for folks who have studied trade union history, uh, the AFL-CIO was more interested in supporting CIA efforts around the world than supporting genuine trade unionism. Uh, so in order to, but in order to develop meaningful international solidarity, I think as uh, uh, Bill Fletcher and Fernando Gapasin say in their book, um, workers in the third world need someone to unite with. So we can't just say we need global solidarity, we need a trade union movement capable of delivering on global solidarity. I was just talking with my friend in UE in Chicago this weekend, and uh, he was saying when he talks to workers around the world, you know, their question more is, what's up with the labor movement in the United States? Why aren't you able to take on capital? And that's, we, so we basically, we're gonna need two things. We need to develop a strong labor movement capable of confronting capital in the United States. And we're also gonna have a labor movement that has the ideology and the politics that's able to support genuine workers' movements around the world. And that would be a fundamentally different labor movement. Let me just jump in here for Joe Friendly, who's uh, uh, videotaping all of this uh, to tell folks that we're talking with Joe Burns, the author of Reviving the Strike, How Working People Can Regain Power and Transform America. So that's the subject here. And, you know, I have some ideas on this also, Joe. I mean, I. I I feel like labor has been very quiet while American, the public in America is really angry about how we've been ripped off by Wall Street and ripped off uh, in terms of 14 million foreclosures, ripped off in the form of everybody losing their retire something from their retirement and everything else. And why aren't we involved in a demand for a jail out, not just a bailout? Uh, to Bring these people to justice because unions are always being lectured about breaking the law. You know, you are breaking the law, you are doing this and doing that, uh, and yet 
the people who have broken the law or have forgotten about the law are allowed total impunity. So that's my uh, 60 seconds here of saying something. Let's go uh, to the folks in the audience. Yes. My question is um, about uh, something that was brought up briefly earlier about sort of consumerism and, and debt. Um, so you mentioned that you know part of the reason that the strike is no longer effective, or you said the main reason that, that the strike is no longer effective, if I'm uh, paraphrasing correctly, um, as effective as it used to be, uh, is that effective strike tactics have, have been outlawed. Um, my question is, uh, it seems to me that maybe the role of, of debt, though, as is as important, or, or maybe even more important, I mean, in terms of like household debt. I mean, we've, we've seen how important household debt has been in you know the, the suffering um, of of the financial crisis brought on by the financial crisis. Um, but it seems to me that you know what workers need to be able to strike is well, a, a social safety net, something to you know keep them afloat, uh, and low expenses, you know, a way to live. Uh, while not at work, and that you know, the effective demolition of a social safety net, and also extraordinary levels of household debt, whether it's in homes, cars, student <coughs> loans, credit cards, you know, the way the things that have been sold to us as you know the means to, to a, a prosperous life have in fact and deliberately um, kept us from, from being effective strikers. Well, I would just say just one little personal op experience I had. I, I did a film before I did Plunder called In Debt We Trust which warned of the financial crisis and talked about the impact of debt. And I went to many labor unions. I said, will you organize a screening of this for your members? Will you help use this as part of your education efforts? And I must say, the response was not very inspiring. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, strikes come in all different varieties. But yeah, some of the traditional strikes, like let's say you take the 1959 steel strike that drug on for 118 days. Uh, and uh, you know, 400,000 steel workers created a crisis in this country. Now, obviously, workers today uh, have different pressures on them. So, what exactly the form and how long a strike can go on, whether it can be this uh, grinding on for weeks and weeks, or whether it needs to be something more dramatic, uh, will change. I think you can go back, and certainly home ownership. You can go back. I was just reading. Uh, uh, Brody's book on the steel workers in the early 1900s, and they basically uh, employers uh, pushed home ownership as a way of conservatizing workers. But on the other hand, I, I think you have to say, well, what? How can we change the concentration of wealth in this country, and how can we move from a society that's uh, debt-driven into one where workers can actually uh, afford to live in this country. And the vehicle to do that is going to be a strike. Now there's a lot of uh, impediments to, to striking. Um, in my own personal experience, I have not found it to be that workers are un unwilling to fight. Now that's, that's just a sample based on bargaining contracts for 20 years, um, but, it, but it, is, it, it is my experience. I think people will have a lot of real hard questions about what your strategy is and have you formulated a strategy capable of winning. And I think to the extent that we're able to build a trend in the labor movement that validates effective strike activity, uh, then we're going to be able to uh, help workers when they do decide to engage in militancy, one, to believe in themselves, and two, to get the kind of support from the labor movement, both officially and unofficially, that they need. Other comments? Uh, I, uh. You keep using the word militancy. Um, I mean, I'm not no expert on labor history, but as I understand it, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and probably the 50s and probably with the Teamsters into the 60s, there was a, there was a great deal of violence in the, in the in the strikes. And there was, I think there was more of a balance of, of power in violence, that the, the, the unions were not automatically going to suffer the, the most casualties. What is your sense of how the role of violence in the, the uh, labor movement is has changed and how that dynamic has shifted as the uh, the government has kind of gained a monopoly on on the tools of violence. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting question. If you if you if you look back, you can see that the narrative has really shifted. And in the 19 doesn't matter if it's the 1910s, 1920s, well into the 1950s, 
uh, unionists believe that they had a right to stop production. That they, and so did labor economists. I mean, you can, you, you know, you go look at any labor economics textbook from the period, and you'll find quotes such as, uh, you know, picketing is not a siege; it's a blockade. And what is the point of a picket? It's to stop anyone who's trying to enter the plant. So there was this, there was this basic understanding, and it was based on some underlying philosophy. Uh, that human labor is not a commodity, and it was based on some idea that labor created all wealth. But it, it, when workers believed that, they believed that they had a right in the enterprises which their labor had uh, sweated and toiled to create. And they also believed that a scab did not have the right to cross a picket line and steal their jobs. So you see during the 1930s, 400,000 workers engaging in sit-down strikes. Um, it was a massive upsurge in uh, 1937, and what that, so you see like some sit-down strikers saying, uh, um, we're willing to defend our right to our jobs with our lives, and they dared uh, Governor Murphy, they didn't want him to come in and use force, but if he did use force, they were going to fight back to defend the plants. So what you saw is in the 1950s, you, you saw that shifting and you saw this big strike, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but the Kohler strike in Chicago, and, which was one of the bitter strikes. And Kohler is still a reactionary anti-union company. They just forced uh, concessions on their workers last year by threatening to move. Um, but, but basically what you, what you saw was that unions who tried to stop production were viewed as the violent ones. And that's how it became to viewed in the 1980s, that when workers exercised their right to an effective strike, they got branded as violent. And we should reject that characterization because we should take the viewpoint that we have the right to an effective strike. And as unionists said in the 1950s, there will be no violence if the, if the employers and the police do not try and push their way through a peaceful picket line. Don't forget also there's a tremendous uh, surveillance society that we live in now uh, with a tremendous, uh, you know, not only police powers, but surveillance uh, uh, technology, everything from Facebook to, uh, you know, uh, SWAT squads and police forces. I mean, there's, there's, it's much harder in a way to, to mount a struggle against power because power has uh, so many tools at its disposal. Uh, that they haven't had. So you, the only way to fight that it seems is to have people who are really convinced in the rightness of their cause and are willing to uh, lay it on the line. And, and there's a lot in the society today that militates against that, including pervasive television programming. We haven't mentioned the media yet in all of this. The, 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 the unbalance between corporate media and corporate perspectives having access you know, around the clock to every American home, uh, 24 hours a day, and labor having almost no access uh, to, uh, you know, people's homes and, and people's heads. So this is something that has also changed the dynamic in some ways. When you talk about a mass struggle as opposed to, you know, a, a local or community-based struggle. Yeah, and certainly many things have changed since the 1930s and... Uh you know, anyone who says we can just go back and recreate exactly what happened there is, is incorrect because we don't have the urban density, we don't have the strong parties of the left, um, we don't have a lot of things. Um, but I'll submit that the underlying economics are the same, and I'll further submit that we need to we need to contend with the changed circumstances. And one final point is, you know, it's. I guess some of this stuff I think is yesterday, but it's starting to get a little bit older. In the early 90s, the Pittston strike, uh, led, led by Rich Trumpka, they engaged in a, a fight a battle in uh, West Virginia uh, where they took on the coal companies and they decided to fight outside the bounds of the law. And they won one of the few uh, victories in uh, modern labor history. Um, in doing so, they racked up $64 million in, dollars in fines against the union as an institution. And if you really want to talk about the control against strikes, I think you have to really look at, at those provisions of the Taft-Hartley Act of Section 301 from 1947, which holds unions responsible for the actions 
uh, of the members uh, if they have knowledge of them or support them or don't disclaim them. So that's why one of the things I argue is that we need to look at forming new forms of unions that aren't subject to those attacks. You see, I mean, this is the arena really for creativity and innovation and organizing today. How do we build structures that can avoid getting squeezed into the traps that have been set up uh, for labor? And bear in mind also, you said, well, things are the same. So, you know, things are worse. Things are a lot worse today. I don't know if you've been following the, the economists who are basically saying that unemployment today is worse than it was in the 1930s. Ben Bernanke saying that, that this financial crisis was worse than the Great Depression. Obviously, most of the media doesn't you know, explain that, doesn't go into it, doesn't really make that an issue that most people understand or relate to. Because in TV, when I worked at ABC News, we have what we call MIGO. I don't know if you've ever heard this expression. My eyes glaze over, MIGO, which means that don't explain anything to anybody that's too complicated uh, for them to understand, or you think is too complicated for them to understand. As a result, people have a very superficial view of what's actually happened here. There's been very little investigative reporting now, analyzing all of this. There's been very little, very few documentaries that really go into it. I mean, I don't know if you saw HBO's big, too big to fail, the tortured problems that Henry Paulson had and working out the bailout, oh, how, how sad it was, you know, that these guys really believed that the banks were gonna start lending again and, and all the rest. You know, we're, we're in an, an era where media, uh, there has to be a media struggle alongside the labor struggle. Labor needs to revive its media capacity as well. With the internet, uh, we have that potential now. And so it seems to me that we have to think about and encourage new forms of organizing. Did you have, please? One thing I would say is that um, the contradiction of, I, I've worked in transit for 31 years and I was there five months when the 1980 strike happened and we didn't have a strike for 25 and a half years. So a lot of members think, oh, you went, you stepped into the boxing ring, you went on strike, you stepped into the boxing ring, you automatically win. You win outright the way a lot of the members think. Uh, and there's a lot of instant gratification in this society. And I saw this in this second strike uh, five and a half years ago. They think automatically you win. Now you're up against a powerful entity, the MTA, backed up by the governor at the time, the mayor at the time, our international was against us. We had a lot against us, you know, and people think you ain't gonna take bruises. You go on strike, you get to throw some punches, and you get some punches thrown at you too. Your ribs hurt, this and that. And people, a lot of folks are used to, we automatic, we, we hadn't struck in 25 and a half years, we should automatically win an outright victory. And people don't want, a lot of people don't want to see that it's a protracted struggle. The strike should be seen in the way of this whole thing is a protracted struggle. And the way everything is aligned, at, at the, the climate now is kind of against you. And strikes aren't going to be these great out-and-out victories and out-and-out uh, victories. It's going to be a victory just to take half what you have and, and fight and, and defense, defend against something and beat back uh, certain givebacks. That's a victory, but people want to see that we went on strike, that's a heavy thing we did, and a victory should be ours within two days. I'm really pleased that you've got your book out, and I've skimmed through it. It's got a lot of really uh, good ideas presented in can a way that people yourself? can be accessible. I'm sorry? Can you introduce yourself? I'm Rusty Gilbert, and uh, uh, I'm active in and around the labor movement. I'm semi-retired now, but I've been involved in strikes, and I was involved in Staley thing that lasted a couple of years. And one of the things I want to say is people should be very cautious about the slogan when you hear it, one day longer, one day stronger. Uh, because it doesn't usually work out that way. If a strike is isolated and people are very determined, it can turn into a war of attrition. And you know something? They win those things. It's really necessary to think in terms of the kinds of strikes that happened in the 1930s where, in effect, the trade union battle became a battle, at least in some cases, for, uh, you know, that everybody was involved in something very much like a general strike in, in <coughs> Minneapolis and Teamsters and San Francisco and Toledo in 1934. It set the, the tone for a big uh, upsurge. But that's then. Let's talk about now because people are pessimistic. 
And there are two things that occur to me. One is that for all the globalization, the kind of production chains that are set up have a lot of vulnerabilities in them. For example, uh, you know, a shutdown of the kind of shipments that go in, you know, from suppliers, overseas suppliers in particular, into, an Amer into American assembly plants. If you can shut that process down, you know, they build engines for Ford in Hermosillo, Mexico. If the railroad workers wanted to, you know, slow down the 2,000 mile journey, which is just in time time, you know, that the auto plant has to stop something along this line. There are people who know more about auto than I do. And, you know, one of the spin-offs from, uh, it's called uh, G GM, uh, spun off a, 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 a factory that made steering equipment, I believe, Mark? Which one? Uh, American yeah. Axle? Oh, mostly axles. But yeah. Okay, axles. And, you know, pretty quickly, that process became very serious business for General Motors, even though they didn't any longer own that plant. And it put the UAW in a position, which it unfortunately didn't use very well, where they had real leverage. So in these global supply chains, there are big vulnerabilities. And the second thing is, yes, it's true. Media is everywhere. We're bombarded by it. But you know, when people make up their minds to do stuff, they find ways. And a lot of the new media is actually fairly accessible. So for example, a lot of the big demonstrations that accompanied the, uh, the immigrant workers movement a few years ago were organized on Twitter, for God's sake. You know, and they were kids, and they have cell phones, and they have Twitter, and they believe they know how to use it better than people most of our age. The fact is that out of Wisconsin, you had incredible stuff done. Uh, how do you think those 70,000, 80,000 people came to the, you know, got started marching on Madison? It was largely through social media. Now, social media's got its vulnerabilities, just past Mubarak or whatever, but we know who won in the end. So I think there's reason to be balanced. Yes, trade unions are weak. Uh, the number of young workers in the private sector who are organized is almost infinitesimal. Striking is not easy, and anyone who says that there's going to be an easy way to revive the labor movement is, is uh, completely wrong. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, and any path towards union revival is difficult. Uh, I think we can go back again to the talk about the P9 strike, uh, which was very controversial in the labor movement, the one in Hormel in 1986. And uh, a lot of trade unionists criticized the local there for taking a stand, and they said they were on a suicide mission and they couldn't win and so forth. But on the other hand, the strategy of the international union was to duck and cover and to retreat and do concessions. And the end result of their strategy was the destruction of a way of life for workers in an entire industry. And what we're left with, uh, conditions in the meatpacking industry, uh, according to one analyst, uh, are uh, looking a lot more like the 1910s than they do like the 1960s and 70s. Um, you see that in industry after industry, mining and so forth. So yeah, there's a, there's a cost to fighting and that's something that individual workers will have to decide. They're not individuals because you don't strike as individuals, you strike as a group. And groups of workers will have to make those decisions knowing the risk, but on the other hand, there's a cost, a great cost for a labor movement which doesn't fight, and that cost is a destruction of an entire life for an entire generation of working people in this country. You know, well said, and, and I think we're really, let's give Joe a hand there. Uh, you know, I, think, I think it took a lot of guts to come out with this book advocating a reinvention, a reinvention of the strike, I'm sure when Fox discovers it, uh, you will be on there to be skewered on a regular basis. One of the people here has apparently been the whipping boy of Fox News lately on labor issues. But these are battles that we have to fight. And I think that, you know, by putting forth this argument, it gives us some, you know, historical perspective, some, you know, suggestion of what we have to do here to kind of think our way out of the box that we're in, that's really important. And, you know, I, I was thinking of your question about debt before. 
And somebody mentioned General Motors. And you know, General Motors was making more money from subprime mortgages through G General Motors Acceptance Corporation than it was through the car company. And yet the union, the UAW, really was saying nothing about the way the you know, finance was exploiting uh, the people. And look at Detroit today. It's, 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 it's you know, a basic uh, destruction of a whole town. I mean, this is a war that we're in now. This is an economic war. When I go into the subway on 23rd Street, and there's nobody working in the booth, there's no way to get a question answered. You're, you're in a dirty, filthy environment. When people aren't there, you see the cost of these cutbacks in terms of services. At the same time, they're spending more and more money advertising all the innovative things they're doing. Look up at this you know, poster in the subway and all the rest of it. But you know, part of the thing is that the Transport Workers Union uh, hasn't been as effective as it could have been in getting support from the riders uh, you know, who really need their services and have relied on their services. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I was, I don't mean to dominate this, Joe, this is your <laughs> night, but I, just one little story, you know, I remember watching when I was a kid, uh, Mike Wallace had a program in New York called Night Beat. He would be smoking, chain smoking, and he was interviewing Michael J. Quill, the, the leader, the organizer, the saint of the Transport Workers Union of America. And he asked him, Mr. Quill, uh, how did you organize this union? And the system was all these different companies. It was very divided ethnically, racially. He says, well, Michael, we tried to take a look at what would unite these workers. And we, there was one uh, area where everyone who would criticized each other all the time were united. We needed toilets in the subways of the city of New York. It came down to tissues, Michael. And through that, we were able to meet a need of the workers, and that was part of organizing the Transport Workers Union. So this wasn't, you know, it was a little superficial. It's more about the ass struggle than the class struggle. But I think it tells us something about creative tactics, finding something that can unite people. And I think if we are to have a new wave of strikes and strike awareness and consciousness, we need to give people a sense that they can win. And that's part of what's been, you know, the, you know, the media is basically telling them, you can't win, you're worthless. And I think what, what Joe is doing in this book and what so many of you have suggested in the questions is that there is an interest in this. I mean, when I came here, there was like one person here. You know, I said, oh, God, this is embarrassing. Now it's, it's packed. So it shows you that there is interest in these issues. You had a question. Yes, please. Yeah. A member of two unions, actually. And the NYU adjunct um, UAW local had a strike vote that uh, took place last February based on, um, well, it was because the, the last labor negotiations, it, every single demand of the union was rejected by management, including, you know, more paper clips and drawers to put our things. I mean, everything was rejected. Um, so we, uh, the union called for a strike vote, which passed. And I was really alarmed to find out that my coworkers um, were not united or, at all around voting for the strike. And in asking questions to them, you know, why don't you think we need to vote to strike after every single demand was rejected? We hadn't had a raise in three years. We were looking at no more raise for the next five years, working without a contract. People didn't seem to understand how important that was. And I realized that what happened, what people were saying was, we're the best paid adjuncts in the city of New York. There's nobody else who gets paid as much per hour for teaching ESL as we do. We should be lucky to even have jobs. I know people who aren't working at all. We should just thank our lucky stars that someone is willing to give us a paycheck. If we go out on strike, you know, think about the risks involved. Uh, there's so little money in the strike fund, I won't be able to survive, blah, 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 blah. It, people were terrified. 
And I realized that one of the problems is that um, there's a real lack of education, number one, among um, workers, and number two, a contingent workforce is really hard to raise consciousness in because people don't have that sense of collectivity. People feel um, that there aren't places where people meet. People work in several different locations. I don't even know all my co-workers. It's, so I'm wondering, uh, and I realize it's a long story to lead up to a question, but um, have, have you come across successful models of organizing contingent workers in this type of situation, or even raising political consciousness and class consciousness of contingent workers? Because I just, you know, at least in the universities, it's becoming more and more the norm that that's who teaches the students. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, those are some questions that uh, that that unions face and you know just to go back to the beginning of what you said it's uh, you know it's sometimes difficult to figure out um, what issues are going to motivate a group of workers um, but I've usually found that it's over questions of respect and so forth um, and it's not always it's not always where you think it's going to be um, and it may not be in a, just because the union in a particular situation wants people to fight back or is insulted, it doesn't mean that that's going to uh, gravitate towards the workers. I think one of the issues we face uh, for contingent workers and in a lot of workplaces is that workers are less socialized on the job than they used to be. Um, a lot of the changes in technology have been, been used uh, to really track every minute of a worker's time. So whether you're talking about UPS drivers or hospital workers or factory workers, management knows where you are and so forth. And if you read some of the accounts of the early strikes in the 1930s in Otto, and especially some books like The Emergence of the Auto Workers Union Local by Friedlander. I mean, he really gives like a blow by blow of who talked to who and who was the advanced and how did you win over different groups of workers. And that's really an essential component. Um, one of the things we've seen over the last couple decades is employers use shifting forms of employment relationships to thwart unionization. So whether it's creating this whole class of workers who are adjunct workers who are nothing other than workers with a different name, or whether it's uh, subcontracted workers uh, or so forth, employers have used the corporate structure to really try and mask the underlying reality, which is workers go to work whether you work for the subcontracted company every day or whether you work, uh, whether you're full-time faculty or adjunct, your labor is the same and your relationship to the employer is the same. So I think it's a question of figuring out forms of unionization that cut through that BS and basically go to the underlying reality. There's an effort in Minneapolis right now by CTOOL, which is the uh, Immigrant Workers Union uh, doing a similar, uh, confronting this problem. They do the cleaning for Cub Foods and some of the other grocery chains. And rather than trying to negotiate a traditional union contract, what they're doing is they're organizing the workers through a community center, but they're going from a worker center, but they're going further and attempting to force the employer to come to the table, not the putative employer, not, not the subcontracting firms that they work for, but rather the grocery stores, which are the real employers. And you've seen that in other industries or in a different sector of that industry with the justice for janitors would be another example where there are subcontracted workers and the union by ignoring the, the legal corporate fictions and going after the real powers in the industry were able to make some breakthroughs. One of the things that uh, that I heard you mention was solidarity. How do we build that solidarity with the workers? Because what I see now, what's happening too, is that they're plotting or going, you know, private sector workers against public sector workers, you know. And so, how do you overcome that to build that solidarity that it's workers in general? I mean, with this media uh, that's portraying, you know, that unions is the bad. So, I mean, how do we, how do we as unions? relate to other workers in other sectors to show that we're here all together rather than this class that seems to be in certain unions that be like, like our union is public sir I mean is uh, uh, building service workers and things of that sort and uh, going back to his internationalism I think our unions was having a big fight with Sodexo that 
is an international company that is coming back on a legal perspective. So how do other unions see that these struggles are going on and you can build that solidarity for the fight for all workers? There's this good book called uh, Cultures of Solidarity by Rick Fantasia written about some uh, struggles that he engaged in personally in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. And what he talks about is that uh, that solidarity isn't something that exists in the workplace, you know, just by itself. It's something that develops in the course of the struggle. And any workplace organizer, you know, naturally does that because you start out with small actions, and in the process of moving forward, you pull people together and they learn about solidarity and acting together. I think one of the problems that the trade union movement has faced over the last uh, several decades is we operate within a legal system which hates solidarity. Solidarity is outlawed, and we we rightfully. Um, denounce the narrowness of trade unions, but on the other hand, it's, it's also an, an, an enforced narrowness because a union legally can only negotiate with one company, and when they try and break beyond the bounds of that, they get hit with an unfair labor practice charge. And even unions such as HERE, they have to, which is a hotel workers union, they have to work to be able to take on these national chains. That's how far the logic has has shifted. So I think the I think what we saw in to go back to Wisconsin is, I think what you saw was how was the solidarity built there? The solidarity was built because a group of courageous teachers decided to go on strike during that critical first week. And they did it, they, they risked their job. They had, the, they had a democratic union and they pulled the stewards together and they pulled people. But they made, a group, they made a decision that it was more important to be at the Capitol than to, than to be working. And they called it a personal protest or whatever you call it, but it was a strike. And in doing so, they built a solidarity because people saw them fighting back and people gravitated towards them. And what you saw in Madison was truly inspirational because you saw these non-union workers coming out and saying, we're not just gonna defend you and your, your demands, but we're gonna defend the very idea of collective bargaining and democracy against a corporate elite committed to destroying it.